joining us today as we share some of uh, the m amazing information for you all as it relates to Coolin DeVries syndrome. Um, we're really, really excited because as you all know, we continue to have a series of calls where you're able to meet some of our medical advisory board um, and learn from a number of different specialties. So I think you're really in for a treat. Uh, so appreciate you joining us and thank you to everyone who's watching on Facebook and live tuning in. Uh, my name is Casey Fisher and I'll be your host again today on behalf of the Cool and Debris Syndrome Foundation. I am mom to a son named Hudson who is turning 11 this month and was diagnosed with KDVS just uh, five years ago. I'm honored to share the Zoom screen today with Dr. Katie Paycheck. She's also a cool mom, which makes this extra special. Uh, I just want to tell you a little bit about her background, and then we will uh, quickly get into the reason you're all here to learn more. Uh, again, Dr. Katie Paycheck is a cool mom who completed her undergraduate degree in athletic training from Creighton University, where she met her husband, Tony. She then earned a master's degree in exercise physiology from the University of Oklahoma, which I am actually from Oklahoma, so we'll have to talk about that later, where she also served as a research and teaching assistant in the Department of Health and Exercise Science conducting research in the Biomechanics Laboratory and teaching first aid and CPR to undergraduate students. She earned her dental degree from Creighton University School of Dentistry in 2015 and has been in private practice in Pueblo, Colorado since. Katie and Tony have three daughters. Uh, her cool kid is Maggie, who is four, Claire, two, and Anna, one, so you are obviously very, very busy. And then in her free time, she enjoys watching sports and enjoying outdoor activities in Colorado. We are meeting today, and thanks to the KDVS Foundation and their commitment to educate, increase awareness, and promote research in the support and enrichment of children, individuals, and families uh, that have KDVS. If you want to learn more about that, uh, please go to the foundation's website, uh, kdvsfoundation.org, for all kinds of great info. Um, before we dive into the main part of our, our talk today, um, I did want to tell you again how much we appreciate you always submitting questions ahead of time. I really think that Dr. Paycheck is going to cover most of those in her talk, but we'll do our very best to get to all of those. Um, along the way, if you have additional questions, please don't hesitate to put those in the Q&A button at the bottom of your screen or in the chat, and we will um, try to answer those as we go as well. And then a bit of housekeeping as, uh, a regard to the actual streaming that we're doing today. Of course, you're seeing it on Facebook, but we will send out a recording afterwards as well. So we'll make sure that everyone gets to, gets to learn more from Dr. Paycheck. Um, so let's just get to know Dr. Paycheck. Let's dive right in because she has so much great information to share today. I don't want to. I don't want to waste any more time. I want to hear directly from her. So, first of all, um, can you just tell us a little bit about what drew you to the field of dentistry and what it was that excited you about that? Well, I always was interested in the medical field, um, medicine, dentistry, working hands-on and clinically. Um, Originally, I thought I wanted to go to medical school, and as I started shadowing medical doctors, they <laughs> told me to go to dental school instead, um, and my, I work with my brother-in-law, so my husband's older brother is a dentist, and he kind of pushed me into dentistry as well. Um, I shadowed a whole bunch of people, and they all said, go to dental school, and I like the meticulous nature of working in, in a small little area and being very hands-on, so um, I really like that about dentistry. Yeah. Wonderful. And can you tell us a couple of fun facts about yourself? I know we mentioned um, that you like sports and there's obviously lots to do outdoors in Colorado, but would love to just learn a little bit more about um, what you enjoy doing that's just totally outside of dentistry or medicine. Oh, um, I feel like my whole entire life right now is consumed with kids. Um, yeah, we like to go for hikes and we like to ski and bike and those things outdoors. Um, I'm originally from Nebraska, so I'm kind of a, a corn husker, even though I live in Colorado now. Um, other random facts. Let's see. I don't know. What's your favorite, um, what's your favorite activity in Colorado? I know you mentioned hiking and Probably biking and stuff. What's your favorite thing? I like Being. to ski. Okay. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. yeah. it's a beautiful place. It is. Wonderful. Um, and then what about, um, if you don't mind sharing, can you kind of tell our audience just a little bit about your own personal journey as a mother to an individual with colon debris syndrome? Sure. Yeah, Maggie was diagnosed at 14 months old. She's five now. So we've 
we've had our diagnosis for a couple of years. Um, kind of came as a total shock. You know, you don't expect anything to be wrong with your child, um, but it came after a series of failure to th thrive and developmental delays. And eventually we found her heart defect. And so that's when we got the genetic testing. Um, our life is filled with therapies as I'm sure everyone else's is. Um, lots of therapies and IEP meetings and those things, oh, yeah. um, doctor's yeah. visits and specialist visits. Um, but she's, she's a joy. I mean, the same things that we all go through that initial struggle of acceptance and finding out what our new normal is um, and then learning to embrace it. So. Yeah. And how, I know that you'll probably talk about this um, as we get kind of get into your work, which we're, which we're going to do um, next. I'm just going to turn it totally over to you, but also, also just interested in, you know, as you think about, especially having that personal connection as a mother to the syndrome and then also your medical profession um, what were the things that started to really stand out to you in terms of dentistry and KDVS? <sighs> There's not a whole lot of research on KDVS and dentistry. So this whole presentation is kind of a, a generalized children with special needs, children with genetic disabilities, um, genetic disorders. Um, I, I've seen a lot through the Facebook page of kids with missing teeth or malformed teeth. So we'll touch on that. Um, I'm a huge super nerd. So at two years old, I was taking x-rays of Maggie's teeth because I wanted <laughs> to know if she was missing any already. Um, so luckily she has those incisors. I already know that. Um, so yeah. I've done some of those things at, in the early well, we're, we're so Yeah. You know, um, I mean, I think it's nice to have parents like you too, where um, you have this thoughtful approach because it's personal to you. And so I think that's what a lot of the families have found that are watching, you know, with all of these specialties where there's just, when it, with a little bit newer syndrome, it's hard to find things out. And so um, just appreciate your willingness to share because I know a lot of people have many questions and um, are excited to learn, but then gosh, what a luxury we have today too, that you have this this really insider info um, into someone with cool and debris syndrome. So again, just many thanks to you for doing that. I think people will learn a lot today. And with that being said, I'm gonna go ahead and just turn it over to you, Dr. Paycheck, and feel free to share your screen and um, I'm gonna go on mute and then um, we'll just take it from there. So the stage is yours. Sounds good. Can, let's see. Are you able to see my, desktop now. Yes, and your precious children. <laughs> oh, that's an old one. All right, there we go. Great, we can see Perfect. it. So I have a whole bunch of information to throw at you guys today. Um, I put my contact information. If Feel free to contact me at the office or personally if this stirs up questions that you have. Like I said, there's not a whole lot of specific dental research as far as KDVS. So it's kind of a, a generalized kids with special needs presentation. Um, Casey, oh, is it not going to, uh, there we go. So like you already said, um, I went to Creighton University, did my undergrad there, my dental school there. Um, it's in Omaha, Nebraska, where I'm originally from. And there's a picture of the beautiful new dental school that I helped pay for and didn't get to use. Um, and this is my family. Is, are the videos in the way or am I okay? No? Okay. Yeah, that's we're fine. Tony. Perfect. Okay. That's my husband, Tony, um, and our three little girls, Maggie, our cool kid, and then Claire and Anna. The most recent picture of them. You probably recognize Maggie with her curly blonde hair from the Facebook page. And if you don't, she's on the home page of the KDVS website. So she's famous. That was Maggie at six months old. So she is famous. I had no yeah. idea. I didn't realize that. What she is precious. Oh my goodness. Um, so if you didn't recognize her from the curly blonde hair, surely you do from the home page. So let's start talking about teeth because I have a whole bunch of information for you. Um, basically, baby teeth, they should start erupting around six months of age. And that's an average. Um, if you get a baby tooth at two months old, or if you get a baby tooth at 12 months old, um, we're not overly concerned about what time that first tooth erupts. 
Um, it doesn't have to be six months. We're looking more so for patterns of eruption. Are they erupting in pairs? Are they erupting in the correct sequence and order? Um, generally, the front teeth will come in first. You'll get those centrals, then laterals. Um, it'll jump to a molar. It'll skip over the canine, come back to the canine, and go back to the molar. Um, girls mature more quickly than boys do. So typically, girls will get teeth before boys will. We ideally want them coming in in pairs. Um, and you should see a dentist as soon as that first tooth erupts or before your first year of life. Generally, that first visit with the dentist is, is like a parent consult. We're looking for gross abnormalities. We're looking for things that are grossly wrong that seem off. And then we're talking to the parent about how to care for their teeth and what they should be doing, what they shouldn't be doing. Um, if they are grossly off in that eruption pattern, then we start worrying about our teeth missing. Are there extra teeth that are blocking eruption of teeth? Is there some sort of pathology that's blocking eruption of teeth? Um, so again, that's an average, that six months is kind of insignificant. What we're looking for is more so patterns of eruption. So baby teeth, again, as soon as they erupt into your mouth, they're susceptible to getting cavities. I love this picture because it shows um, a permanent tooth and baby teeth. Um, the permanent tooth has a lot more enamel on it. So this white outer part is the enamel. That's the protective structure of your teeth. It's hard, it's calcified, um, and it's going to protect your teeth from wear and tear and cavities. These are baby teeth. Can you see my cursor? I don't know. Yeah, okay. So those are baby teeth. The enamel is a lot more thin. So they're more susceptible to cavities. And when you do get cavities in baby teeth, they tend to progress a lot more quickly. A lot of the time people think, oh, they're baby teeth, they're gonna fall out, it's fine. We don't need to address them, um, but they serve a lot of functions. Obviously they help you chew and eat and speak, but they also act as space holders for the permanent teeth. So the permanent teeth that will come in underneath them to push out that baby tooth and erupt, um, the baby tooth acts as a space holder. Ideally, if you had perfect baby teeth, you'd have space between all of them because that makes room for the bigger permanent teeth to come in behind them. And you can kind of see that dark spot there. That's an air space on this x-ray. So there's space there. As soon as two teeth touch and you don't see that air space, we can't see be between those teeth clinically. Um, and so x-rays are recommended. So it might seem crazy that your dentist wants to take x-rays at age two or age three. It seems kind of early for that. But if you can't see between those teeth, you can't detect whether there's cavities there. And as soon as those two teeth touch, it's recommended that you start flossing at home as well. Katie, did we lose you? Ashley, can you hear her? I cannot. I thought it was me. Katie, are you there? I think her screen froze. Uh oh. Let's see if she comes back. Well, okay, Casey, so you can use your expertise and, and tell us all about teeth, right? Yes, all about. <laughs> Uh, yes, I can not tell you it. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no, we lost her. Okay, we'll have her come back. Do we want to pause the recording just for a second until she jumps back on? Sure. We'll still be live on Facebook, but yeah, we can go ahead and oh, pause. Oh, perfect. Okay, well, then it'll just be the, the uh, Casey and Ashley show for a moment until she comes back. What do you want to talk about? Yeah, um, <laughs> we, can talk, we can keep talking about teeth. We I can also like. talk about the fact that we have more webinars coming up. We could, that would be a safer topic for yeah. sure. And one of which we probably know more about. Yes. <laughs> um, I actually have them all right in front of me. Um, it looks like our next one, correct me if I'm wrong, is um, through our partnership with It Takes a Village, of yes. which we're going to do an IEP talk, which is great timing because we're all probably getting ready to face IEPs. Um, this one will, will be specific to pre-K through fourth. And Ashley, do you mind to tell a little bit about It Takes a Village and the partnership there? Absolutely. So It Takes a Village was created because, as we know, rare disease organizations are all volunteer run by parents who are very, very busy. So I define who represents Kleefster syndrome and um, SET BP1 society, who represents SET BP1, um, we kind of all 
became friends and said, hey, why don't we work together instead of all of us trying to do webinars separately, let's all work together. And I define as run by a man named Jeff Ryan and his wife just happens to be a special education teacher in the elementary setting. So we thought, great, she could do the first one. And then one of our dads, um, Dan Morelli, who did an IEP thing for us a year ago, he's going to come back and do the uh, fifth through 12th grade time so that we'll be able to do that. But that's not going to be until um, June. So we just have lots of things like that and just trying to combine as one. And Leifstra and KDBS are both researched at Radboud University in Netherlands. So it's kind of works to um, bring them together. We have similar symptoms. And um, so, yeah, we're excited about it. I love that. And another one that we're doing this summer, which you all will love, um, if you haven't worked with B. Moyes before, um, she's going to come in. And I believe we're going to talk about siblings, correct, in this correct. and just really navigating that, um, having conversations with your children that have a sibling with special needs. And so she's been just a really popular speaker in the past and has agreed to come back and join us. So we have a lot, we have a lot coming up that I think will be really great for families to, to learn about. So, um, and with that, Dr. Paycheck's coming back. <laughs> I, I made it back um, somehow. Yay! My internet, everything in my office just turned off all of a sudden, so. Just love that. Well, that's okay. We took this opportunity to talk about all the eight other great webinars we're doing. Um, and yeah. Ashley and I decided that continuing the conversation around teeth probably wouldn't do it justice. And we would um, <laughs> wait for you to come back. I can say I do have my children brush their teeth, but that's, that's about it. And they do get regular checkups. And that's about all I can offer to this conversation. <laughs> Good things. Um, okay. Perfect. We have you back. What was the last thing you heard from me before my computer? Sure. Um, if you turn your slide back on, I think we had just flipped forward away from the slide that was showing the teeth with the spacing and the imaging. Okay. So I could, I, I'll get you back where you froze. <laughs> okay. Did we talk about toothpaste? We were just starting to, and okay. that's when the screen froze and went down. I think you had oh. just flipped over to that. Okay. <laughs> Sorry. Okay. These things happen. Part of technology. I know. Lovely. Part of being a special needs parent is being flexible and just going with it anyway, right? So I think everyone on this audience is, is good with it. Good point. Good point. All right. Let's go back to one with toothpaste. Got it. That's the one. There we go. Toothpaste. All right. So at six months of age, it's recommended that we start using fluoridated toothpaste. Um, and you want the tiniest little smear or size of a grain of rice is all you need. Um, once they turn three, you can put a, a little pea size amount. And basically that's all you need forever and ever. Um, commercials, they put that big, huge glob on there and that's super wasteful and makes you buy more products. So not necessary, a pea size amount is all you need. Um, if they swallow that amount at those ages, it's totally safe and it's fine and it's not going to cause fluorosis. Um, prior to six months, if they don't have teeth erupted, it's not recommended to use fluoride yet. Um, and sometimes kids complain that toothpaste is spicy, which I think is adorable. Um, if it's spicy, there's a lot of good over-the-counter, um, like fruity flavored toothpaste, Swiggle and Tom's make kind of a more mild toothpaste. Um, or if they don't tolerate toothpaste at all, dip it in a fluoridated mouth rinse and just brush with a wet toothbrush. If they just have the front teeth, it's okay to wipe them down with gauze if you prefer. But as soon as they have molars and they get the grooves in the teeth, um, you're better off using a brush and brushing them. So, so Katie, can you go back to that just for a second? I know a conversation that comes up a lot is, should it be fluoridated toothpaste or not? Yes, fluoridated. After six months of age, fluoridated. Thank you. Yep. Or as soon as the first tooth erupts. So if they erupted their first tooth at five months, start the fluoridated toothpaste then. So as soon as the first tooth erupts or six months, whichever kind of comes first. So at about age six, you'll start getting permanent teeth. The most, most of the time you'll get your six year molar, which will come in behind all of the baby teeth. Um, so you get kind of a mixed dentition of primary and permanent. And at about age 13, you'll have lost all of your baby teeth and have all of your permanent teeth. And it's recommended at about age seven to see an orthodontist. 
again, that initial visit with an orthodontist is kind of that same initial visit with a the dentist. They're looking for major problems. They're looking for gross issues that need addressed pretty much immediately. Um, something that would require early intervention or early treatment. And then at about age 13, again, you'll have all of your permanent teeth, except for your wisdom teeth. Those will erupt around 16 to 25, depending on the kid's development. Um, sometimes they never erupt, which is okay too. They can stay in there forever. Those apply to all children, um, neurotypical and special needs kids. So we'll kind of get into some of the differences between special needs individuals. Um, anomalies in tooth development, size, shape, eruption, arch formation are all common with kids who have genetic disorders. Um, gum disease and gingivitis are more prevalent in these populations, mostly related to poor home care. Um, and we'll get into that as well. Enamel hypoplasia, dental crowding and malocclusion, um, trauma to teeth because they're not very well coordinated and fractures, um, tooth grinding, drug-induced gingival enlargement, and then oral aversions and again, just home care issues being more difficult in these populations. So missing teeth. I know um, this is a very common thing that people wanted touched on um, because it's a big deal with our kids. The prevalence is three and a half to six and a half percent in the general population. I couldn't find a real good statistic for what it is in kids with special needs, but obviously we know it's higher. Um, the most commonly missing teeth are wisdom teeth, which is a good thing. If you're missing those, then you don't need to have them extracted. Um, the mandibular second premolars are down here, and then the ones that people are most con um, concerned with are these maxillary lateral incisors. And as far as general population, if your mom or dad were missing teeth, you're more likely to miss teeth as well. So there is a, a family occurrence that's common with missing teeth. Um, malformed teeth, again, those peg laterals, those front teeth are very commonly misshapen in kids with genetic syndromes. Sometimes you're missing a tooth, sometimes you have a peg, sometimes you have a combination of one's a peg, one's missing. Um, they come in all, all sorts of combinations and it kind of shows how you can basically bond tooth colored filling material onto those mal-shaped teeth and, and make them look normal. If you are missing the teeth, there's replacement options in terms of dental implants, bridges. Um, if spacing is an issue, you can reposition the teeth orthodontically and just close it with canine substitution. There's removable options where you can take a denture in and out or like a retainer in and out. And which one is best? It kind of depends on the kid. It depends on their age. You know, you don't want to be putting an implant in because the implants fuse to the bone until you're done growing. And so until that bony growth is done at about age 19 for girls and 21 for boys, um, depending on the crowding, um, if you just wanna close that space with canine substitution, depending on how the teeth come together and the bite, a bridge may or may not be an option, how much bone you have, and then also home care and finances. How are we going to maintain this, you know, um, both financially and taking care of it for the long term. This is basically what a dental implant in the missing lateral incisor looks like. It's a titanium post that goes into the bone. Um, it's kind of the gold standard way of replacing missing teeth because you can floss between it and treat it as much as you can as like a natural tooth. Um, and they look really nice. You can make them look really nice. This is that bridge option that I was talking about. The good part is for these is that it's pretty minimally invasive. Um, but the bite kind of has to be right. When these are done well and they're done it with the right case selection, they can last 30 years. Um, if you choose to do it in the wrong case where the person's bite is off, um, you can pretty easily destroy these pretty quickly too. So that's kind of what a, a bridge would be. This is that canine substitution that I talked about where you can see these teeth are the pointy canines. Um, so if you have a whole bunch of crowding and you need teeth pulled anyway for braces, this might be a good option to rather just move the teeth into that position and your orthodontist will pull the canines down and then you'll reshape them and add some bonding to where they basically look normal. And that's, that's canine substitution for those missing teeth. 
um, gum disease is a lot more prevalent in our children as well because it's, they just have a harder time caring for their teeth. Gingivitis is exactly what it sounds like. It's inflammation of the gum tissue. Um, when you eat or drink something really sugary, um, you get that fuzzy feeling on your teeth. You can scratch it off and it's kind of that gross stuff. That's plaque, that's bacteria that's mixed with sugar that's sitting on your teeth that causes inflammation and can cause cavities. If you don't clean it off well enough, your gums get irritated um, and it causes gingivitis. If you brush it off and then you get your teeth cleaned and you start taking care of it, um, that resolves and you have no long-term lasting effects. If it doesn't get cleaned off well enough and it progresses to calculus or tartar where it hardens, um, that bacteria sits there and your body can't remove it. So your body's natural response is to move away from it. So the bone and the tissue will recede away from that bacteria and you'll get bone loss and that's not reversible. So once gingivitis progresses to periodontitis, it's, it's a lifelong thing that you're gonna be dealing with. And because of those home care issues, our children are a lot more likely to develop these conditions. Um, again, poor dexterity, oral aversions, that sensory issues, those things are all going to contribute to not keeping our teeth as well. Um, that plaque that sits on your teeth will mineralize and harden with the minerals in your saliva, causing tartar. And so our kids drool a lot and have a ton of saliva, so that will make that calculus harden a lot more quickly. Something else to be aware of, I know Maggie takes Pediasure to gain weight, as many of our kids probably do. Those things are filled with sugar, and so they're gonna build plaque more easily as well. And then also your tongue, aids in speech and mastication, but it also helps clean your teeth. You know, when you get something stuck in your teeth and they clean it out with your tongue, um, our kids and their low muscle tone and poor coordination can't do that as well. I'm sure many of you have also picked food out of your kids' teeth. I picked peanut butter and jelly off of Maggie's roof of her mouth because her tongue isn't strong enough and she doesn't have the, the dexterity to remove it from the roof of her mouth. So it's that mechanical removal of your tongue that they're also kind of lacking in terms of cleaning their teeth. And Can I ask you a quick question? Um, just back to that, because we do get a lot of questions about the saliva pooling mm -hmm. and just the drool. Um, for those kiddos who do get that, where it builds up quite a bit and pretty quickly, should they get a, a checkup more regularly? Or how do you deal with that? What's the best thing to do? Yeah, most of the time, either meticulous and meticulous home care where you are on top of it and brushing all of the time. Um, but Maggie has calculus buildup, but the dentist kid has tartar buildup. <laughs> um, so it is gonna be something that we probably, instead of getting our teeth cleaned every six months, we're gonna get teeth cleaned every three to four months. Okay, so, that's helpful, um, thank you. There's also another dentist in town who has a special needs child who deals with the same thing. So there are two dentists in my town who both of our kids have tartar buildup because of that saliva pooling. So uh, parents at home, you're not alone. Um, and then G-tube fed children tend to get calculus even more so. So another thing that parents with G-tubes get to deal with on top of everything else, they just tend to build it up more, probably because they don't get that oral stimulation and that tongue movement and that mechanical removal of plaque and debris. So even more meticulous home care. I know. Um, cavities are basically caused the same way as periodontal disease, that plaque buildup that's not cleaned off your teeth. It's just a different type of bacteria that causes cavities. Um, these initial cavities are present as like chalky white spots. At this stage, they don't need to be repaired. Um, they need to be addressed. They need to be shown to the kid, shown to the parent, um, that says, hey, we got this going on. It doesn't need to be fixed right now. But if you don't address the at-home behaviors, it's going to turn into the brown cavitated lesions at, or even worse. Um, and again, our kids are predisposed to this because poor home care, I, I hate to say poor home care because we all take pretty good care of our kids' teeth, but um, more difficulty in home care. And then 
added sugars in those drinks and added sugars to medications to make them taste good can all contribute to that stuff that, that we have to deal with. Um, and animal hypoplasia is something that is common in kids with developmental disabilities, kids that are premature, kids that were intubated or on TPN. It's basically like a yellowish brown mottled appearance of, of teeth and it can happen on any teeth. It's just poorly formed enamel. Um, some sort of trauma or some sort of drug fever, medic something along the line where that enamel was forming inhibited its ability to form correctly. And so the enamel is weaker and in lesser amount. So it, the enamel will wear more quickly. You're more likely to get cavities. You're more likely to have sensitivity and they just kind of look icky as well. Um, crowding and malocclusions are definitely more common with kids with special needs. Um, a class two is kind of where the jaw is set back a little bit. And then a class three is where it's pushed forward kind of like the, the Jay Leno chin. Um, both of those are more common. If you lose your baby teeth, the space holders that we talked about, the permanent teeth can shift and cause more crowding. And then tongue positioning can definitely lead to malocclusions. And we'll talk a little bit about that as well. When I said that you should see an orthodontist around age seven, these are some of the major issues that they're looking for, crossbites. So where the bottom teeth fit on the outside of the top teeth, the top teeth should basically fit on the outside at all times. It can either occur with the front teeth or the back teeth. Um, major crowding issues that need to be addressed. Minor crowding, they probably wouldn't address right away. Um, open bites, that's usually sucking on your thumb, a pacifier or fingers. Um, this can also be caused that protrusion from a thumb pushing on it. Um, so we'll talk about pacifiers and thumb sucking. Ideally, we want these kids to stop using them by age three. Um, Maggie's five and she still sucks her thumb. So again, we're working on it. Um, pacifiers are definitely preferred to thumbs because you can take them away. So if you can get them to take a pacifier, we much prefer a pacifier. Um, try to eliminate it again by age three. You can clip off the end of the pacifier, basically making it shorter and shorter till there's nothing left. Um, yeah, there's all sorts of ways to try and stop thumb sucking, but they, there has to be some sort of a desire for the kid to stop. We kind of looked at some of the malocclusions that it can cause. Um, definitely going to need to be corrected with ortho. However, the good news is if you are able to stop thumb sucking and stop pacifier habits at an earlier enough age, um, a lot of the time the teeth will self-correct themselves. That malocclusion will self-correct itself if you can stop it early enough. So, so there's that's promising. This is basically what Maggie's teeth look like from her thumb sucking. She has that anterior open bite. Um, it will affect her speech. You can't say your T sounds because you don't have the teeth together. Um, so speech will be affected by it. Eating will be affected by it. You know, try biting into a sandwich when your front teeth don't touch, um, as well as the palate development. So ideally, your tongue should be sitting on the roof of your mouth when you're at rest. I know you're all doing this now because I'm saying it. Um, it should kind of sit right behind the front teeth and rest on the roof of your mouth. Um, and it should kind of press on your palate and kind of spread that palate open. When you suck your thumb, you're getting kind of a narrow pressure from the thumb and you get kind of a higher vaulted palate rather than that broad wide palate. Um, so it can also affect the palate development a little bit there. Ashley wanted me to touch on this. And as I made these slides, I kept thinking about Angela Morgan and her presentation a few months ago when someone asked her a question about this, because it's a very polarizing topic right now. Um, phrenectomies, everyone is cutting them. They're, they're super popular right now. Um, however, there's not a whole lot of good research to support doing so. There's not, a, there's not a lot of bad research to not do it, and it's a very low risk procedure, but there's not, like I said, a whole lot of good research to support doing it. It's recommended when it's affecting your speech or it's recommended when it's affecting feeding or if your tongue can't even reach the roof of your mouth. If you're that tongue tied that it can't reach the roof of your mouth. Um, those are the times that it's recommended to do so. 
we do recommend a multidisciplinary approach. So Maggie is tongue tied. We talked with our speech therapist, our feeding therapist. We talked with uh, my friend who's a pediatric dentist, our ENT and pediatrician. All of us agreed that she's tongue tied. All of us agreed that it was not affecting her speech or her feeding. So we elected not to cut it. Um, a myofunctional therapist you might not be familiar with. That's not necessarily a new professional. Um, they've been around for a while, but again, they're kind of gaining traction with the phrenectomy um, movement. It's kind of a physical therapist for the mouth and the oral cavity. They work on tongue positioning. They work on proper swallowing. Um, and so if you were to cut a tongue tie, I would highly recommend seeing a myofunctional therapist to retrain the tongue in terms of where to put it and proper positioning and proper swallowing and those things. Um, and, and also the stretching exercises. If you don't do the stretching exercises to um, keep that tongue tie loose, um, it can reattach and then you have to do it again. So for all of those reasons, I'd probably consult a myofunctional therapist. Um, the reason um, we actually didn't cut Maggie's was because the ENT said that he's had several special needs individuals after their tongue tie was cut, that kind of open mouth, like lazy tongue posture, um, you know what I'm talking about, got worse, and they ended up biting their tongue and causing trauma to themselves. So I definitely would not even consider cutting a tongue tie um, without having a myofunctional therapist to reposition that tongue and retrain where, to, where your tongue should be inside your mouth at rest. Um, the maxillary phenum, that one, um, probably less common to be cut. Um, I'll probably skip over that slide for more so time purposes. The tongue tie is a little bit more important. Um, we found that the ability to touch the roof of your mouth is actually more important than it is to stick it out. Um, that used to be kind of the, are you tongue tied? Stick out your tongue. Um, it's more important that it touches the roof of the mouth again for that arch formation and that palate formation, again, for the tooth, um, not tooth development, but feeding and how your teeth align. Um, whether it will have skeletal um, formation changes is debated. There's not a whole lot, like I said, not a whole lot of good research to support cutting a tongue tie um, and changing that skeletally. Um, also not a lot of bad research, but there's not a whole lot of cause and effect of, you know, if you cut this, it's going to fix these problems. So kind of controversial. This is what we're talking about, these bottom two pictures um, of pretty severe tongue ties. Trauma, again, poor balance coordination just predisposes our kids to, to trauma, to dental injuries. Um, if a baby tooth gets pushed out of place, it, we used to tell you to stick it back in. Um, don't stick it back in, call your dentist. Either we leave it in place and itself, it repositions itself, or if it's affecting the occlusion of how the teeth come together, it should just be pulled. Um, permanent teeth, if they're pushed out of place, either you can push it back into place as soon as you can, or call the dentist and we'll push it back into place and splint them together as soon as they can. If you, if you break off a chunk of your tooth, um, if, if they're like tiny little pieces, don't bother saving it. But if it's a, a large chunk of a tooth, sometimes we can glue it back together. So try and save it, either saline or milk, stick it in something and bring it back to it. Bring it back to us. Um, and just something to note that if you do damage, um, sorry, the kids got me sick. <clears throat> if you do have trauma to the baby teeth, it can sometimes cause abnormalities in the permanent dentition. So kind of some examples, <coughs> excuse me, examples of trauma where teeth are pushed in and intruded. So those teeth got pushed up. Don't touch them. They will work their way back down. If that tooth, <coughs> sorry, if that tooth fragment, if you can save it, um, save it, bring it back to us, that's good. If this is a permanent tooth that came out all the way, bring it back to us. Hopefully we can put it back in and reposition it and save it. 
this is called the Turner's tooth. So this basically means that when they were a child, they had trauma to the baby tooth and it got pushed up and touched the developing primary or permanent tooth underneath. And so it leaves kind of a, an enamel hypoplasia spot. It's not harmful, it just looks kind of ugly. So if your tooth, if your kid's tooth erupts like that, that basically means that they had trauma um, to the baby tooth. <coughs> Sorry. Proxism is tooth grinding um, and wear on teeth. Our kids, again, are more susceptible to all of that stuff. Sometimes there's no reason for it. Um, just having a developmental disability puts them at greater risk for grinding their teeth. Um, if they have sleep apnea or reflux, they can sometimes grind their teeth at nighttime, more so for jaw positioning to open that airway. Um, sometimes it's drug related, stress related, <clears throat> for all sorts of reasons. <coughs> yeah. This is <clears throat> drug induced gingival enlargement. It's pretty rare. We don't see this very often, but it's important to touch on because there's three classifications of drugs that can cause it. One of them being anticonvulsants, which I know a lot of our kids take. Um, calcium channel blockers are for blood pressure, so probably not um, overly important, but immunosuppressants. I know there's at least one cool individual who had an organ transplant, so is probably taking some of those medications. Um, the good news is, um, the prevalence is all over the map, but a lot of the drugs that our kids take, like Keppra is not on the list, and Tegretol is not reported. Um, the highest prevalence is usually with Dilantin, which according to Dr. Myers, if I'm correct, doesn't work very well in cool kids, is that right? I believe. Um, so again, Dilantin and kind of Cyclosporin are the ones that were primarily considered. Um, I threw a whole bunch of information on this slide and I'll kind of skip over it a little bit. Children are more likely to have this develop than adults are. Um, males are more likely than females. There's nothing you, really you can do to prevent it. You can take really, really meticulous home care to try and minimize it, but if it's gonna happen, it's gonna happen. Usually it won't require surgery to get rid of it. Um, and the most effective way to get rid of it is to substitute medications, which if it's an anticonvulsant and it's working is not really a possibility for our kids. So something that you have to deal with. Um, a few tips on home care for more so adults with dexterity issues. You can always add like a tennis ball to the end of a, a toothbrush or um, stick a handle of like a hairbrush or something like that onto a toothbrush because they're tiny. You can even bend a toothbrush to make it easier for holding. Um, they make little rubber props to hold them open. They make little foam things and I have pictures of them on the next slide. Um, if you haven't heard of a surround toothbrush, they're like the coolest things ever. Um, it has toothbrush bristles on all surfaces. So it makes it more effective and more efficient to brush their teeth. Um, there's tons of toothbrushing apps and timers that you can use. Um, a lot of the newer electric toothbrushes will have a, a QR code to scan and go to their website that you can watch um, a two minute video where they brush something off to kind of distract them and keep them entertained for two minutes. And if they're able to tolerate that, um, that vibration from electric toothbrushes, they clean so much more effectively, they really do. Um, I tend to prefer the, the Sonicare um, over the Oral-B. I feel like the Oral-B or like the cheaper battery powered ones just vibrate a whole bunch more. Um, and so it's more of a sensory thing um, where the Sonicares go a little bit, they're a little bit less, you don't feel the vibration as much. Um, so they're a little bit more tolerable for, for sensory issues. Um, so here's kind of a few examples like I said that tennis balls where you can grab a hold of it. Um, this is that surround toothbrush. We have a few of those at home. They're so cool. Um, they have bristles on all sorts of surfaces. Um, a lot of pediatric dentists will carry them for special needs individuals and I think you can buy them online. This is a foam prop or just a, a little homemade prop to help keep them open when they don't want to brush. Um, any lighter or any torch or any candle will bend a toothbrush. Oh, plastic. Great idea. Yeah. So 
I, I've done that for a few of my elderly patients who have dexterity yeah. issues. I love, I love the tennis ball. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Brilliant. Um, I never would have thought of it. Your occupational therapist should have some ideas as well, but yeah, put a bend right. in a toothbrush. Seriously, take a, a lighter to it, bend the plastic, run it under some cold water, and it'll create a bend that makes it a little bit more easy to reach some of those areas. So you should definitely have a dental home established by a year old. Um, you should have a dentist. Um, you can really see any dentist. A general dentist might be fine, but there are pediatric dental specialists. I'm a general dentist, um, four years of dental school, and I just went out to the general public. Um, pediatric dental specialists go on to additional two, three years of training just for kids with special health care needs. Um, they'll typically, typically, yeah, typically going to take Medicaid, which is a benefit for most of us. Um, and then they're going to have hospital privileges and be trained in sedation and those things. So um, if for some reason there's a whole bunch of work that needs to be done under sedation, pediatric dental, dental specialists are, are going to be a really, really good option for those. Um, most of them will see your kid until they turn 18 or 19. If they're special needs, they'll probably extend it a little bit further for you until 21. But um, it's recommended to actually start the transition process earlier, mostly because if there are those issues of missing teeth and how we're going to replace them and what are we going to do, the pediatric dentist is not dealing with implants, they're not dealing with crowns, they're not dealing with any of those things. And so in order to create that planning process for how are we going to address these missing teeth, you want to probably do that around 14 to 16 and get established with an adult dentist who's going to be taking over that care. Um, in the rest of the world, they have such things as special care dentistry, but not in the United States. We are getting better about that. Um, but yeah, the largest barrier to care is for adult special needs is finding a dentist who will take them and then also take Medicaid most of the time. Um, yeah, in other parts of the world, like I said, they have a specialty for that. In the United States, we don't. Most of our cool kids, as long as they've had a pretty good dental home and established care, are going to tolerate a general office just fine. Um, however, if they have severe needs um, where, again, they need sedation, they need a whole mouth of work done, or there's a lot of medical issues going on that a dentist doesn't want to take on, look for GPRs. A GPR is a general practice residency. So a dental school, after you've graduated dental school, you can choose to go on to a residency or not. Um, a general practice residency is some of that more advanced stuff. A lot of the newer GPRs have programs that focus on adults with special needs. So there'll be hospital-based programs that um, will do sedation and full mouth cases on these individuals. Um, so, so look into a dental school. If somebody who's already graduated from dental school, um, so they're well trained um, and they're just going on for additional training and that stuff. And again, if they are an adult, don't forget your guardianship paperwork um, for HIPAA reasons. And then a couple other kind of random considerations that I didn't feel like was totally necessary for its own slides, but I ran into as I was creating this is depending on their health issues. Um, Maggie had heart surgery six months ago. And so she, it was recommended that she not have her teeth cleaned for six months. Um, and if she did need any work done in that six month time period, it would be recommended that she have antibiotics prior to dental work. So something to consider, talk to your cardiologist about, um, and then plan ahead. I mean, we see mostly adults in our practice and probably once a month we get, it's always an old man, an old man who needs a joint replacement in two weeks and he needs full clearance to, even though he hasn't seen a dentist in 10 years. Just plan ahead for that stuff. Um, if you know you're going to have upcoming surgery, you don't want to go into a heart surgery um, with cavities and teeth or an abscess tooth. So plan ahead, you know, don't do that in a few weeks ahead of time. Plan ahead for it so that you have have lots of time to not only get the diagnosis, but get the work completed and heal up before, before that stuff. And I think that's all I had. What kind of questions do you have for me? Excellent. I, yeah.
to get them. Um, I moved them out of the way so I could see your talk. So let me move them back in front of me. Okay, so you've answered a lot of the questions that came in from the families, but I was just looking back to see if there's anything that we maybe didn't cover. And if we did, please forgive me. But um, so one of the, the questions we got a lot about was just um, orthodontia, mm -hmm. like age-wise, you know, is there a specific time that you should start thinking about that or you should wait till longer? What are, what's your recommendation there? So you should see an orthodontist about age seven, um, just for that okay. initial consultation to see if there's any of those major problems going on. Um, if there are none of the major problems and your general dentist says you're fine, um, you probably don't need to. Um, okay. But yeah, around age seven is that initial consultation. There are some problems that, like I said, some of those major problems with that, a narrow palate. Um, if you don't catch okay. a narrow palate soon enough, that palatal suture fuses and you can't expand the palate. So there is kind of a, a too late time period. So it's better to see an orthodontist early. And many times the orthodontist will want to see you early so that they can catch problems. And sometimes the orthodontist we use will put um, patients on a recall. They'll say, I want to see you again in six months and see what you look like. I want to see you again in a year. And so the orthodontist will do their own follow-up as far as how things are developing. Um, so around age seven for initial okay. thing, they may or may not start treatment depending on, like I said, how, how severe the, the issues are. Yeah, and um, another question that I noticed, um, I, I deal with this with my own son quite a bit, is he struggles to spit out the toothpaste. So mm -hmm. this one came in in terms of if they don't have that ability to spit, is it okay that they're swallowing the toothpaste? And is there a type of toothpaste they should be using knowing that they're not going to be able to spit it out? As long as you're using that grain of rice size under age three and a pea size amount after age three, it's totally fine for them to totally swallow it. Okay. Excellent. Um, okay, that's really good. Yep, fluoridated. Good and, okay, perfect. Um, you're right. Don't do the commercial look. Yes, <laughs> not even for adults. Um, not, yeah, that is a little ridiculous. They're just trying to sell us some toothpaste. Um, so the other thing that came up, and this, I'm, I was thinking about this when you said being prepared for surgeries. So with wisdom teeth, I know mm -hmm. you mentioned there may be the possibility they just don't ever grow in, but if they do. What, did, what do you recommend as the approach? Should they plan to have them taken out and just kind of know that's coming or how do you think about that? So kind of careful monitoring of them. You know, if they still remain in the bone, again, this is this kind of differs from the US to European models as well. Um, the US is a lot more, I don't know, it's preventive or we remove wisdom teeth ahead of time a lot more than the Europeans do. The Europeans kind of wait for problems to arise before they extract wisdom teeth. So there's kind of two different trains of thought. Right. Um, so typically American dentists will send you to an oral surgeon to get them taken out before they ever cause problems. Um, it's kind of a careful watching and waiting as far as you want to remove them when they're about half to two thirds of the way developed. If you remove them before, then there's a chance that you leave a piece of it in there and have to go back through a second surgery. Um, if you wait till they're fully developed, they're more difficult to remove. So there is like a happy medium of when you want to get okay. them out. Um, but sometimes they do, they stay in the bone entirely and they never erupt. And so you can leave them in forever and ever. Just kind okay. of careful monitoring as far as, um, are they going to cause problems? Are they not? Um, there's no harm in leaving them in there. Some, the old train of thought was that it would cause crowding. Um, and people who don't have wisdom teeth still get crowding. So that's kind of been disproven as well. Um, good. Okay. Well, that's good. That's really, that's really helpful. Um, cause that's a, that's a really big decision to make. Um, one more thing I wanted to ask you, cause I think we, I'm just double checking, but I think we covered all of these. You did, did such a great job in your talk. Um, the last one I had was around sensitivity. So mm -hmm. again, just another question around if, you're, if their teeth are really sensitive, is there a specific toothpaste or does it go back to some of those brushes you recommended? What are your thoughts there? Um, I guess I would kind of want to know why the teeth are sensitive. Is it more so okay. the enamel score? Um, if that's the case and they are able to spit, there's prescription fluoride toothpaste that can help 
strengthen up that outside enamel. Um, you wouldn't okay. want to use it if the kid is not spinning um, or if they're young enough to where if they have permanent teeth, I guess they could probably eat it and it wouldn't hurt them, but it's not real good for them either. Um, okay. So a prescription fluoride toothpaste or a fluoride mouth rinse would be good things to help with sensitivity. Um, there are desensitizers that we can put on teeth. Some of them stain teeth, some of them don't. That's just like a topical solution that we can paint on there. Um, okay. Grinding and clenching teeth can cause sensitivity, just that trauma. So if it's related to that, you'd want to address those issues. Um, cavities can cause sensitivity. So is there unaddressed decay? It's kind of hard to say. Um, yeah. What well, and maybe just even the over, because correct me if I'm wrong, but if you overbrush too, and, and it kind of makes your gums more exposed, I guess that would also cause. Yeah, yeah. Gum maybe just the washing with the brushing. Yeah. Okay. Um, and I'm glad you said all that about enamel because right as you were saying, right before you answered that a question, one of our only questions, I think the last one that came in through the chat was just around strengthening of the enamel. enamel. So it sounds like as long as they can spit, there would definitely be that painting or something that they could use through their, yeah. their dentist to accomplish that. Yeah. Yep. Yes. Perfect. There's any sort of topical fluoride um, and the dentist will be, most of the time be putting on a topical fluoride as well. There's fluoride in water, so drinking water will help strengthen your teeth as it's in contact with your teeth. Um, acidic foods, <laughs> you see those commercials oftentimes. Oh, yeah. They break down <laughs> tooth enamel. That is, that is true. Acidic foods can break down tooth enamel. Um, yeah. This was um, so helpful. I, I really appreciate you sharing. I know we're um, just coming up against our time, but... Um, what I what I love about everything you shared is it's I think easy for all of us to take these great tips and apply them immediately. A lot of the things that we learn, it's we can't always apply them right away, and so it's so helpful that these are things we can turn around and do. So I know you're very busy. You're calling in from your practice. So again, many many thanks to you for taking time out just to get on the phone and share with all of us. Yeah, you're very welcome. Sorry for the weird communication no, issue initially. It was fine. It, it, it was fine. You gave us a chance to promote our upcoming IEP right. meeting. We're having a web webinar um, coming up about IEPs. So um, everyone, please stay tuned for those. They're all posted on our website where you can go and register and see the calendar of events. Um, again, just before we close, I would be remiss if I don't thank the KDBS Foundation just for helping us organize and put all these together. Um, so just very grateful for that. Of course, uh, Dr. Paycheck put all of her contact information, which is so kind. So Thank you for sharing that. And, and again, for everyone who tuned in, thank you for taking time um, to learn more. And we'll look forward to seeing you all um, very, very soon. So y'all have a great day. Thank you, Gracie. Bye-bye.